Judith, how did you become interested in gerontology? Hi, Laura. You can call me Judy. So um, it was an accidental interest. I mean, I, I was exposed to the field through a series of events. Um, I was an undergraduate major in sociology at St. Lawrence University, and I was an honors student. And um, you know, took courses on marriage and family and so on, the traditional courses, and uh, decided to go into a PhD program. And at the last minute, I changed plans, decided not to go to Tufts University in Boston, where I'd been accepted, but to go to Syracuse University, where um, a boyfriend of the time was going to architecture school. So by the time I arrived at Syracuse, and, and in August, to you know, figure out how to start in a few weeks, all the teaching assistantships were given out. So, the chair of uh, sociology, Mark Abramson, at the time said, "Well, you know, there's a new program that's starting called the All University Gerontology Program, uh, and um, <clears throat> Professor Walter Beatty, who was a, a social work professor well known in the field, has a bunch of stipends." And I remember saying. Gerontology, Latin, I remembered it was a study of something, and I literally didn't know what it was a study of. Um, so there I was at 21, you know, a, a you know, cum laude graduate, and I didn't know what gerontology was. So I walked down the hill and I met with Walter, and he told me about it, and so I was in the first class of the famous Administration on Aging Traineeships in Gerontology that were sponsored by the Syracuse University, All, All University Gerontology Center. So um, for the traineeship, you had to take four courses and um, internship for your certificate. So I was hooked immediately, and I have never looked back, and I've been in the field ever since. Can you tell us how long you've been in the field? So that was 1972, so that's 42 years. Thank you. So, this leads to our next question. Describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist. At what point in your career did you embrace gerontologists to describe yourself? So I guess first describe your career trajectory. Okay. So, it, you know, I reflected on this about two and a half years ago when I was invited to write an article for the Atlantic.com, the AtlanticMonthly.com. And I wrote that with Professor Bob Maiden, who's a professor of psychology at Alfred University, director of their gerontology program. And so we both looked back about, you know, our trajectory and what influenced us. And, and so it was, it was a stumbling beginning. I, 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 you know, again, I'm an accidental gerontologist, like about everybody in my cohort. So we came in from the traditional discipline. So for me, it was sociology, and I was in a very theoretical department at Syracuse University, and I was really dissuaded from pursuing gerontology in many ways. Like it was depressing or too applied since it was in the School of Social Work, and why would I want to do that? And so I struggled with the, the whole, you know, making the field of gerontology or aging you know, relevant to sociology, and I really didn't have champions in the Department of Sociology to speak of to help me bridge that. So that was difficult for me. And um, eventually, um, I, ne I did not get that PhD. I finished all my coursework, but then I got a master's in public administration. I'd always been interested in policy after my master's in sociology. <coughs> so I left Syracuse um, having interned in the U.S. House of Representatives in a special, on a special task force on aging in the House Republican Conference. I task forced there twice. And so I, I've always been interested in the legislative process. And so um, that exposed me, you know, to Washington and, and to some of the players. And so after I got my MPA in 1976, I moved to Washington. Um, after working on the senatorial campaign of John Hines, who was a, a representative and running for U.S. Senate. And I was in charge of what was then called the uh, Senior Citizens for John Hines Committee. And so, you know, that, was, that dates me right there, Senior Citizens. So I, I traveled all over the state, and I had coordinators all over, and I talked about John Hines, and he won. So then I was invited to work as a very junior um, 
staff person, uh, basically what they call the legislative correspondent, where you answer letters. Mm. There I was with two masters, and I was like, hmm. <laughs> so I had read something about the um, establishment of the new National Institute on Aging and Science, and Dr. Robert N. Butler, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, was a founding director. So I applied, didn't hear a thing, seven months later, I had gone to lunch when I worked in the Senate, came back, and it was like a scribble note, because we all shared this bullpen. Call, blah, blah, blah. And I called, and it was um, HR at the National Institute on Aging. So I applied for the job. And it was pretty competitive, so I got a position as a special assistant to the director, and Bob Butler. Bob was a very important uh, influence on my career. He's, he, he was my boss, so I don't know if he's really my mentor, but he was very encouraging of my career and always wanted me to get a PhD. So I worked at the National Institute on Aging in several positions, legislative liaison, program evaluation, and, and um, uh, program planning. And then when Dr. Butler was invited to establish the first department of geriatrics in a U.S. medical school at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, he invited me to join him as part of the team as the basically the administrator of somebody who had the ability to set up a new department with them. So I took that on and um, was able to really expand that role and I um, simultaneously was the deputy director of the International Longevity Center. Bob was very interested in establishing interest in, in centers of excellence in aging and um, other countries so we started with Japan. and. Um, he gave me flexibility to initiate projects. I became interested. I've always been interested in housing for older people, so I worked with colleagues to secure Section 202 funding um, from HUD. So I'm still chair of the board of Linkage House in East Harlem, New York. Um, so I was very lucky to have him as a chairperson who was encouraging uh, and let me role, expand my role. So through that, I, I became more secure in, in what I could contribute um, um, as a gerontologist. Um, then it was time for me to really do what I've always, I needed to do, which was to get my PhD. So I was at a meeting in, in um, <clears throat> Albany uh, and around, uh, it was, a, I think, a New York State Office for the Aging Related meeting. I was taking the train back from Albany to New York down the Hudson. I ended up sitting next to Marjorie Cantor. So Marjorie Cantor was a major figure in the field. So she says, dear, now dear, I really, you've got to get your PhD. She said, you know, times have changed. When I, you know, in my age, my cohort, you could, you could get by with a master's no longer. You've got to get a PhD down. Dear, now, now Fordham has a great program. She said it may not be, I don't know what she said, something like Harvard, but it's a great program and it's a cohort program. And you can, all the classes are on Wednesdays. So I applied and I went to Fordham and um, that really, I think, was the, the next stage of molding me as a gerontologist because there they had a track on gerontology and it was focused on policy and research and not clinical mm -hmm. and so um, and then after that I was um, I, I made the decision to kind of leave the more administrative work and dive into being a faculty member so I was invited to be an assistant professor at Mount Sinai School of Medicine and I just um, I found a groove I don't know I, I, I love to conceptualize, I've always been this way since I was little, come up with an idea and, and, and then implement it and, and just try to replicate it. So I, I just like that process. Um, so and I was able to do that with the um, housing for the elderly. I wrote about it, I talked about it, I, I, you know, I, I, I think I helped expand the um, integration of housing and social services. So I had kind of become more confident in, in my niche. So at that point, I had the opportunity to work on funding proposals around geriatrics education. And, and I was able to be, I was really good at writing funding proposals and getting money. And in, in academia, that's a currency. So then I went 
through the ranks to professor in a medical school. Um, so here I am. Um, you know, I, I've written a lot. I'm editor of a journal, Gerontology and Geriatrics Education. Um, it, it's kind of weird when you get... I remember going to GSA when I was a student and I saw all these people with all these ribbons in their patch and they all looked very important and I thought, oh gosh, how did they ever get to be that way? Because for me, and I, I think we're going to talk about mentoring a bit more, I, I, I didn't really know how to get from being that really junior insecure student to being that person who gives advice to other people and, and is established in a field in an organization. So now people kind of tease me when they see me with, you know, my GSA badge with all the ribbons. And um, I said, well, you know, I, I have, I'm just involved in a lot of different things. I can't choose one ribbon over the other. You've said yes to a lot of things in your career. So do you have particular uh, female <coughs> mentors who have impacted your move into gerontology? Well, I mean, I when in the 70s and 80s, there were not formal mentoring programs. I mean, I had a non-traditional backdoor approach to getting into the field of gerontology. I mean, I didn't like go into, I wasn't in a program such as maybe USC or something where there was a formal PhD program, initially in my field at least, where there were, you know, where you were matched with mentors or there were career development initiatives with mentors, none of that. So, which I was, is too bad. I think I, I probably made me more insecure and less secure in finding my voice in the field, to be perfectly honest, and that's why I'm such a committed mentor now. So, um, I mean, as I said, my accidental mentors, and this is in the Atlantic, and I, um, could send you the link to that particular article if you would like. It's it called it, um, Accidental Tourists. I think it was a, something like Accidental Tourist um, in the field of gerontology. Uh, so Marge Cantor and then Rose Dobroff, um, who was the head of aging, the Brookdale Center on Aging in Hunter College. She was very helpful to me when I moved to New York and helped introduce me to people who, you know, were fixtures in the field of aging in New York and, and in terms mm -hmm. of the um, network of services and, and academia and so on. And then later, um, Barbara Berkman, who um, is a, a leading academic in gerontological social work, had just received funding from the John A. Harker Foundation for the Faculty Scholars Program and Geriatric Social Work. And so I um, worked with her on that initiative in the early days, in the late 90s. Um, and she was tough. I mean, she's still tough. I just saw her the other day. And she's, but, but, you know, somebody to learn from. I mean, if, if, you, can't, if you can't take a tough person to give you feedback, What's the point of the mentoring relationship? And then there was another person who was the chairman of the Department of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai after Dr. Butler left, Dr. Christine Castle, who was a physician. Um, and she was very helpful to me. She was tough. I wouldn't call her a mentor, but she gave me feedback, which is what people need to hear. So, for instance, now, when I have a mentee, and I've, I've been in several formal mentoring programs at NYU School of Social Work through the New York City um, Merging Aging Professionals Mentoring Initiative and others as well, you know, if somebody, it, it, it's a commitment on both sides. And, um, and sometimes it's hard, if you're a mentor, to give advice that could be a little direct, but you know, you've got to be open to that. You, you know, if, if you really want to succeed in life, you just can't smile, smile your way through it, you know. Um, so, anyway, I wish I'd had more of that. But more constructive criticism. Well, I wish I'd had more structured mentoring, which mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if 
I think I think a real successful mentoring relationship is dyadic and it's it's mutual it's mutually it's a mutual exchange but I think that the junior partner in that dyad needs to be open um, to constructive feedback. Great. Well, I want to thank you because you probably don't remember, but several years ago, my first Aggie conference, I signed up for a grant writing workshop. Oh. And you were at the workshop, and Graham Rawls, and Jennifer Kinney. Oh, yeah. And I walked in and I said, wow, these people are the top in their field, and they're here with me, <laughs> who doesn't really have an idea for a grant, oh. but just guided me through the process and I just want to thank you for being so accessible because at the time I just didn't I didn't really have a good idea of where I wanted to go or what I'd be doing but just knowing that you cared enough to in me as a young wow. just I just want to thank you for that. well thank you for thanking me <laughs> what how many Aggies ago was that we oh, did it for about, about three or four yeah we did mm -hmm. it for six or seven years mm -hmm. Did you write a grant? No, but I'm now at the point when I'm finishing my capstone that I know now where I want to go and that I will need funding. And mm. so I'm, I have that folder of notes that I Oh, took. you do? Oh, yeah. Yes. And so I'll, I'm going to refer workshop. back to that. Oh, yes, good. And all the materials you provided and willingness to you know, be a contact. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm, glad. I'm glad we did that. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a, a different um, look at things. How has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that um, I was just reading and, and gave my students, where I, I work now at, um, at Mount Sinai and the GREC, the Geriatric Research Education Clinical Center at the Bronx VA, um, Elaine Brody's seminal article on being very, very old, uh, reflections of a gerontologist on growing old, and there's been some other work in that area, and it's interesting because I think that um, as you age and, and move through it, I mean, there are challenges, and I think that, you know, it's annoying to me when people talk about, you know, 60 being the new 40. That's just not right. It's not true. I mean, you know, there, so there's, there are the silver linings in the clouds of old age. I mean, and I think that we gerontologists probably see the opportunities for productive and successful aging beyond golfing or something more than the general public. On the other hand, we do understand that there are, you know, challenges such as, you know, dementia, you know, loss of social, you know, spouses, social networks, um, this diminishment of function and things like that. So, you know, it's always there, but I think as a gerontologist, um, you understand what can lead to a more robust old age, such as, you know, uh, intergenerational friendships and linkages and engaging in avocations that are enjoyable and that contribute and staying engaged. So, so I think that, you know, it's, do we like to get older? I, well, you know, it, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's actually, I think I tell people it's not so bad, you know, as you go through it. Just life's a long journey, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I, I love that. So the last question, <laughs> the Wiggle Project, this project, focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. So within that framework, is there anything else you would like us to know? Well, it's interesting now that I'm considered an older woman gerontologist. Older is all <laughs> relative, you know. Older is older that's than a person right. is younger. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. No, that's fine. So, um, well, I think you, you want to, you want me to, so, you know, something that bothers me a little bit. I mean, I, I, I consider myself to be a feminist, and I think that many of these older women gerontologists probably feel the same way and 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 our and our growth as individuals and as members of society and professionals and gerontologists has been shaped by feminism and so I you know just always worry a little bit about um, 
the women's movement or that the seems to have diminished in some ways and that there seem to be younger um, people who don't identify themselves as feminist because it got a bad word and I don't know exactly how it's linked but you know I am um, I'm the overall director of a fellowship program in palliative care at the VA and it's interprofessional with MD social workers, PharmDs, and I sometimes have a book club and I was, um, I had used Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg because I think it's excellent. Well, one of my co-directors who's a physician said, I just think that's a waste of time. I said, well, I, you know, they're, they're, they're young women in this program and, and you know, I, I'm trying to you know, give them a book that will engender a conversation. You don't have to agree with everything about it, but will help give them the tools to navigate careers successfully, whether they're gerontologists or palliative care social workers or whatever. She says, well, I, 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 you know, I don't know, but I'm not a feminist, and this woman is my age. She said, I got along just fine through, through life. I was just lucky. I, I just, you know, I was given opportunities, and, you know, I don't understand this feminist stuff, so... I think I'm a little off track here, but I, I, I think that the empowerment, you know, and the network that women can bring, okay, in terms of, you know, empowerment is really important for emerging gerontologists. Now, you know, and so somebody else said, another person who's a leader in the fellowship, well, I, I just think this is discriminatory. That, you would have a book club that's focusing more, is focusing on women and, 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 and doesn't speak to the men fellows. As much. I mean, so, you know, well, sometimes you do need to speak to women. I mean, sometimes that's necessary. And so I feel that I'm always still battling people who I feel personally are not as enlightened as they should be. There needs to be specific, specific mentoring that's targeted, I think, from older women to younger women about whether it's gerontology or social work or just succeeding in life and so you know I, I've always been pretty outspoken so I guess I'll probably always be outspoken they say you grow into your personality mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's great that you brought up that point because I still think as a woman that we're juggling way too many balls and I was humbled by the way that women here in the field of gerontology have reached out, especially <coughs> my mentor, in just providing the opportunities and encouraging participation, whether it's um, working on a paper or a poster or just opportunities to speak in front of a group. And I just think I agree. I totally am humbled by that and have never encountered that within any other profession in my life, so thank you. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing profession in, 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 in terms of uh, bringing up or, um, you know, kind of shepherding the lives of, of more junior colleagues, you know, um, I, I think. But, you know, of course, it's been my field. But, you know, in, 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 ter in terms of when I thought of myself as a gerontologist, that's a tricky one because it's such an interdisciplinary field that the label, you know, sometimes people think of themselves well as a social scientist or a sociologist or a social worker, you know, and so I think that being a gerontologist is a great way to identify, but sometimes other people don't know what it means.